We're continuing our series in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Isn't the human body amazing? <laughs> Nurses, chiropractors, other physical based people out there. I think we'll most physical based people. Human, <laughs> physical based people. <laughs> um, we'll know that the human body is a pretty remarkable um, piece of engineering, piece of design. Um, without noticing it right now, you're sitting there, you're breathing, you're thinking, you're living, you're thriving, you might say. Yeah, there's a lot going on without you even noticing. You might um, point those things out, so you'd be very aware of it. And now I've pointed that out. <laughs> um, you might not have noticed, but your tongue is now in your mouth. Yeah, until you notice that your tongue is there, suddenly mine is now very big and strange. Um, but you don't notice it, right? Your human body does lots and lots. Um, the human body is amazing. Daniel is learning stuff faster and faster. It's really interesting seeing what he picks up. Um, he's learned elbow this week, so he goes, elbow, and demands to see your elbow. Um, next weekend, I'm turning 30, so I'm definitely feeling absolutely in my prime, as you know, prime of life is 30 years old, isn't it, apparently? Some of us might at the moment feel slightly past our prime. That's okay, um, because today's passage is about new bodies. It's about our new body, which we are going to be given. Um, but don't worry, this isn't some miracle cure exercise plan where some muscly home crying advert says, This was me just six weeks ago. This can be you six weeks from now. Um, it's not like that. It's not some strange dystopian enhancement program based on the Vitruvian man and the ideal person. Um, in fact, this is about our promised resurrection bodies for the promised new creation. Um, we're going to have a look at the passages for today. So if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, you'll see that verse 1 starts with 4. Oh no, so we've got to have a look to see what it's there for. Um, we've got to have a look at what happened last week. Oh, look at that fine specimen. <laughs> last week, John was speaking, um, I wasn't here, but thanks to Heather's YouTube editing, I was able to take that picture, without even being there, of John. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Um, as you can tell, last week was John um, speaking about jars of clay. Right, we had um, uh, the passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, jars of clay, how we're being renewed on the inside. Uh, Paul and Timothy were writing to the church that inside of us, inside of that jar of clay, as you can clearly see, was a, um, there's a light, like there's a light inside of ourselves, which God has put there, which is renewing us from the inside. Um, that light, that hope, that life is greater than the shell that holds it. Uh, the, the passage last week spoke of our inner selves being renewed by God. Um, and importantly, as John is wearing today the same t-shirt, uh, just to highlight the message, that is why we never give up. That is why we never surrender. And John's t-shirt says, never give up, never surrender. Uh, so maybe the writers of, was it Galaxy Quest? Maybe they were reading the Bible when they came up with this. <laughs> Maybe. And um, I was saying to John, I quite like the Transformers slogan of no sacrifice, no victory. But it's still the same. Really. <laughs> um, the, the passage speaks of the future weight of glory being greater than our present night and momentary afflictions. Um, I don't know when the last time I described my own afflictions as just light and momentary was. Um, they're quite super difficult, they're real, they're problematic at times, aren't they? But however heavy our problems can feel with us here, um, Paul is literally promising to us that there is a glory which we will see, which vastly outweighs the stuff which we get bogged down with now, where we bogged up with um, future glory. It looks, uh, it speaks of looking at the things which are unseen that last forever, not the things now which seem, which will soon be gone. Um, though, if I'm honest, the thing I will remember most was the um, angry seagulls, because that was genius. The uh, parable of the sower, John said. Quite often you think of the nice little birds going tweet, tweet, tweet and stealing the, the seed from the path. Actually, it's probably a lot more like an angry seagull, isn't it? Angry seagulls um, going off the chips, they're, they're scavenging the seed. and the, the enemy doesn't want the gospel to land in your heart, so it snatches it up immediately and just politely tweets along and steals it away. Um, so, uh, the verses for today, chapter um, 5, verses 1 to 5 is on the back of our inner selves being renewed, right? On the back of our inner selves being renewed, Paul says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, 
not built by human hands. Our outer self is remade too. And we are to be clothed in immortality. We should sing a song of that day. <laughs> yeah, maybe we did. Um, Paul speaks of us here having a new eternal body. In this life, our self, our spirit, our person is clothed in an earthly tent. We have this earthly body. We are restricted by the laws of physics, of biology, of maths. Um, this earthly tent will age and be destroyed, um, whether through old age or other things. As a local parrot owner once said, we will cease to be. We will expire and go to meet our maker. We'll be bereft of life and pushing up the daisies. Our metabolic processes will be history. We'll have kicked the bucket, we'll shuffle off our mortal coil and run down the curtain and join the choir invisible. We will be an X person. Monty Python? Monty Python. We, if this earthly tent is destroyed, when this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, right? a better thing which we will inherit. This tent disappears, but the, the building um, remains. Right? The, this is a building from God as well. We enter that eternal house in heaven. Jesus says, doesn't he, in John chapter 14, um, he says, My father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me. This room that we are going to inherit in our father's house, in Jesus' father's house, in our father's house, this house, this um, eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, is a gift prepared for us from God. Not built by human hands, but built by God's hands. Um, so that's pretty cool, isn't it? Next verse, Paul continues. Um, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly body. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly body, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. At the moment in this tent, Paul says, we tire, we groan, we struggle at times, but then we will not. When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, we do not become spiritual, ethereal beings which float around, right? We don't become cherubs with harps that we just play sitting in clouds. That's not biblical. Um, we don't float around immaterially. The Bible teaches that we will not be naked spiritually, but we will, and unclothed, but reclothed, right? Redressed in a new body, in a new heavenly body. We're created to be physical, bodily beings. Um, when our inner renewed self is freed from its flesh, it's not freed to be purely spiritual, but to be clothed as Jesus is now clothed in his resurrection. And those burdens will be released. We can stand up, we can put on our immortality. Mortal swallowed up by life, that's death that's swallowed up in victory. Um, and I do want to highlight uh, one, of the, one of the lines which we, we sang from um, Lou Fellingham and Fat Fishes, There is a day. Uh, one of those lines is that we will be like him as we as we see him in the air right we will be like him in his new resurrection body we will get new resurrection bodies just as jesus was like us and um, jesus was physical right jesus's resurrection body is particularly was physical but also super physical it was natural but also supernatural um, we read in the in the gospels we read how jesus could not as a magic trick, but he appeared and disappeared as at will. Right? He was suddenly amongst the disciples in their locked room, and he was suddenly not with them anymore. Um, he appeared on the road beside um, the two people walking. Was it Damascus? I think it was Damascus. Walking on the road, um, he appeared with them, and then he disappeared as he broke bread with them in their house. Um, and yet, also Jesus ate and drank and walked and talked. Um, he did all the normal things as well. Uh, specifically, he was physical. In that he said to Thomas and to some of the disciples, look, feel the scars on my hands. You can feel them. You can't feel something if Jesus wasn't real. If Jesus was a ghost there, right? It's very clear that Jesus bodily returned to us. Jesus resurrected um, in the flesh, but in a new flesh, in the new body. Um, and in fact, one of the, one of the things that the early church uh, we, we read fought against was the, um, the idea of ghostitism. Um, I don't know if I said that correctly, but docetism, a form of Gnosticism, which is uh, kind of a wrong belief, um, that docetism states that Jesus wasn't physical. Jesus was always a spiritual being, only he only appeared human to us. Actually, he was spiritual all the time. Um, why did some people think that? Well, uh, you, you can read about this in, um, in the Bible. 
<laughs> in, um, in the kind of literature around it as well. Well, the, the Greek view at the time, uh, one of the Greek views I should say, was that earthly stuff, physical stuff, mortal stuff, was entirely corrupt. And so Jesus could not have been physical or he would have been corrupt. But that's entirely the point of Jesus being physical, isn't it? Jesus was, in, Jesus was a real human baby. He was born, he was a real human person. Um, and he, he lived his whole life without being corrupt. Um, but we know that Jesus was physical and, um, and more than that as well. He was fully good and fully man. Um, John starts his gospel with uh, chapter 1 verse 14. He says, the word became flesh. And he's talking about the word was with God, the word was God. And then God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Uh, Paul writes in Philippians 2 that Christ, though he was in the form of God, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, but becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And also last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, it said in it that Jesus is the exact likeness of the Father. Right? Jesus is fully God. He's the exact likeness of the Father. He's fully man. He, he put off, he emptied himself of his godness. He was born in the likeness of man. The word became flesh. Um, why does that matter though? Right? Why was that important for the early church to kind of fight against? Why is it important to us today that Jesus was a fully human and fully God at the same time? Well, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says that we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. We have a high priest who can sympathize with us, right? Jesus was fully human because he came to rescue us, and we are fully human, but he was fully God, and he was able to do so. Um, and also, on the, on the slightly lighter note, Gnosticism is just a bit mean, really, isn't it? <laughs> if Jesus was just tricking you, and oh, just kidding, not really real. I was just <laughs> appearing before you the whole time. Um, anyway, uh, why are we to be clothed um, instead, in our heavenly building, what is mortal to be swallowed up by what is immortal, um, by life. Where well, in verse 5, Paul says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Why would this happen? What assurance do we have that this will happen? The, the very purpose of being clothed in immortality and following him, um, the one who fashioned us for this is God. That's why it's happened, because God wanted it to happen. God chooses, God chooses to clothe us in um, immortality, but not yet. Um, it's our purpose to worship God, to walk bodily with him again in paradise. But remember, Jesus says to the, the guy being crucified on his right, I think, whichever way you're looking at, um, he says to him, doesn't he, that tonight you will dine with me in paradise. You can't eat and dine if you're not uh, you know, at least semi-physical being, and you can't do that, right? you can do that in paradise, right? Jesus says, you will eat with me, you will dine with me in paradise, you will be with me. Um, we're promised that the, uh, when Jesus comes to rescue his, his church, his bride, that there will be a great wedding feast. Feasts don't happen unless you can eat stuff, right? Um, it does raise other questions, but <laughs> we, we don't know how it works, right? We don't know how eating works in heaven. Um, but there's a feast to go to, and I bet it'll be the best feast that we've ever been to. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, also, amazingly, the assurance we have that this happens, the assurance we have that we will get new bodies where we don't feel pain, where we don't um, ache and groan and go, oh man, I'm getting so old now, I'm not even 30, I'm getting old. Um, the, the assurance we have that this happens is the spirit in us as a divine. The spirit in us is a guarantee of what is to come. Isn't that amazing? Right? The Spirit is a guarantee of what's to come. So, end of chapter 4 and these first, um, these first five verses. We have been renewed on the inside. That's what we kind of saw last week in the first half. And we will be renewed um, on the outside. The Spirit within us guarantees that for us. It guarantees what is to come. So before we continue, I think it's really important to ask ourselves, have you been filled with the Spirit? Do you have the Spirit within you? Do you know that the Spirit filling you here on earth once and for all is a guarantee that God has chosen you as his child, that he's rescued you from the change of sin and the fear of death, 
He's given you the gift of eternal life, and the Spirit is your guarantee. Um, if you don't have the Spirit, if you've not been baptized in the Spirit, then I, I guess everything must just seem way, way harder. Um, there's much more worry, right? Have I done enough this week? Have I been a good Christian this week? Um, without the assurance given by the Holy Spirit, um, I came off with three um, easy false teachings or three religious mindsets which we can fall into, right? Um, if, if you don't have the Spirit and you're just trying to walk this Christian walk by yourself, um, I think, firstly, it can be very easy, even if you have the Spirit and you forget about it, right? It can be very easy to think sometimes that you are saved by your level of faith and hard work. Um, perhaps you said to yourself, if only I had more faith, a stronger faith, or if only I served more or prayed harder or read the Bible better, I'd be more sure of my salvation. If you've ever thought that, um, it's not true. Okay, those things are, of course, good. Pray for more faith. Serve more. Pray more. Read the Bible often. But those things don't add to your salvation. Right? The gospel is not Jesus plus work. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. Right? Your level of faith and hard work cannot save you. Um, you might fall into the mindset of you are saved if you're a good enough person, or even because you have been such a good person that God has chosen you to save you. Um, maybe you think God chooses me because I don't sin very often. I'm, I'm a good question. I, I live quite well. You know, I manage to not commit adultery or murder or anyone, so I'm pretty good. <laughs> um, God loves me because I try it so hard and I manage not to sin very often. But that's not true either. Right? That's almost the complete opposite. That's not true. The Bible does not say that. Um, it is, of course, good not to sin, but we all do still sin until we reach the other side, until we are given, until what is mortal is put off and what is immortal is put on. We will still sin sometimes. Um, being good is not yet possible. Um, when, when somebody uh, in the Bible calls Jesus good, he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And you know, the implication is that you can call me good because I am God. Um, but for us, you know, our goodness isn't yet possible, only God is good. Our goodness does not add to our salvation. The gospel is not Jesus plus goodness equals salvation. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. Only Jesus. It's only down to Jesus. Uh, thirdly, you might find uh, you're thinking to yourself that you can be saved because you keep rules and regulations. You might think, if I pray every day and read the Bible every night, if I avoid unclean food and unclean sin and stuff like that, and I will get um, right with God. Or maybe, maybe, as some people did, uh, right at the time of this letter was written, you think, if, if I get circumcised, then God will love me more. Thankfully, not true. Um, <laughs> other, faiths, right, other faiths require um, laws to be kept. Um, in, in Islam, you must obey the rules as good as you can, and your ability to obey the rules is what saves you. And if you can't obey the rules, then good luck to you. Um, but even even the old covenant, right? Judaism, the old covenant required the law, and where that law was broken, it required sacrifice. Um, but that's not true anymore, right? We cannot add to our salvation by obeying rules and regulations. Um, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. He was the ultimate law follower once and for all. Um, Jesus says, "I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfil it." So it has been fulfilled already. We don't have to fulfill it. Again, it's good, right? We should try and do. We should try and live good. We should try and read our Bible and um, pray. You know, we should do those things. Um, we shouldn't try and be circumcised. But, okay, the gospel is not Jesus plus the law, Jesus plus regulations. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. What are you saved by? You are saved by faith in the work of Jesus in you. Jesus is redeeming work. Jesus is sanctifying work. It's all about him. Um, the Spirit in you then guarantees for this to come. Um, so, if you want prayer for that, come to the front, the back, at the end. Grab a friend, grab somebody you know. Okay? Ask them, can you pray for me? I'm not sure I've ever been filled with the Spirit. Or can you pray for me? I want that assurance which you guys are speaking of. Because uh, we have that assurance. Come and get it. And um, we can pray. I'm happy to pray with you. Um, anyway, enough of that slight detail. Um, our passage doesn't stop there, Paul doesn't stop there. There's a challenge in the second half of this part. Right? Um, there's a challenge in verses 6 to 10. Um, the, I want to say that, oh, I forgot. Look, see? Not true. <laughs> there you go. Gospel, Jesus, that's nothing. 
piece of that. Um, <laughs> to carry on, um, we, I want to challenge you. Um, I think that Paul wants to challenge us. He wants to challenge his readers. Um, which dwelling base are you in? Where are you seeking? Where are you spending your time? Are you out of earthly tent and heavenly building? Are you glamping it out in your earthly tent going, <laughs> oh, this is amazing, I'm going to have the best time I can? Are you ignoring your earthly tent entirely and going, it's all about the place to come, it's all about the place to come, ignore here, it's all about what's coming next? Um, both of those things, I would suggest, are wrong. Um, let's read what Paul says next. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. We can read this bit in two ways. We can read this both as a statement, as a fact, as a mathematical tautology, I think it's called. Um, when we are alive on earth, we are away from God, and when we are away from the earth, we will be alive with God. It's kind of mutually exclusive, you're either here or you're there. But I feel that we can also read it as a challenge, right? Of where is your heart? Home is where the heart is. Are you at home? Are you building your home here or there? Um, is your heart with Jesus? Right, remember we were sinners, but now we are saints. I'm sure we still sin, but we are, our position has moved, right? Um, remember a few weeks ago, I spoke about the triumphal procession, uh, which we are called in, which Christ leads us in. Um, Jesus is the triumphant all. He has won a victorious battle. He's leading us through, um, effectively with the spoils of war, right? We've been rescued, we've been redeemed. Um, Jesus has brought us from that realm um, into the new realm, into the, the kingdom of eternal life. So where is your heart? Is your heart still in the old kingdom, in the earthly tent? Are you loving it in the earthly tent and think, oh, I guess the I guess the heavenly building will be quite fun, but you know, I'll miss this about life, and I'll miss this about life. Or, or are you doing the opposite and thinking, God, just can't wait till we get there. It's going to be so much better than this place. Um, Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21, uh, reminds us of the same thing that we're looking at today, but in a slightly different way. Uh, Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says, We are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our saviour. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Right? We don't belong here. Our heart is in our new citizenship. We are citizens of heaven, right? We are still here, but we are citizens of heaven now. Um, so, if they, if they kind of consider where your heart is, but um, even though in these verses, Paul, Paul even goes as far as to suggest that it's better to just stop life, right? It's better to just go. It'll be better there. Um, actually, we are called to be here, living, to be with Jesus, right? Um, we're called to something whilst we are here on earth. There is a purpose for our life beyond reaching its end. We are supposed to be here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here anymore, right? Um, was it Elisha? I think it's Elisha. Or is it Elijah? Which one is in the chariot of fire? Elisha or Elijah? Elisha. Sure. It's Elisha, isn't it? It's the first one. It's Elijah. It's Elijah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Elijah. The first one is Elijah, right? His, when his role is done, when what he's supposed to be doing on earth finishes, God comes down, there's a chariot of fire, he jumps in it and throws down his cake to Elisha, who then picks it up and has another double portion of his blessing. Um, once his work is done, he goes off, right? He goes off, all right then, okay. Uh, we read kind of similarly of Enoch as well in Genesis, that he, he, um, he was one of the, I guess, fewer people at that time who was walking with God. And we just read that he walked with God and there was no more. Doesn't technically say he dies. So maybe he just kind of went on a nice spiritual walk and got so caught up that he died. Or maybe God said, right, you've done everything I've called you to do. Come with me. Uh, we don't know. Um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Paul says, objectively, sure, heaven is better, right? Objectively, heaven will be better, except for the fact that God has called us and has a plan for us here. God wants us here now. Uh, we live now by faith and not by sight. To live by sight will be amazing, but while we're living by faith, let's do stuff in faith. Um, let's please him on earth. 
Paul says we are to make it our goal to please him all the time. Let's please him on earth, and then when it's time, we can please him in heaven as well, with our new bodies and our new houses. But to please God now is to live, is to do what he's called us to do. So what are you called to do? And think about it. What are you called to do? What is your purpose here in Red Valley right now, in Trafaris right now? Um, what is it? Have a think, have a pray. Um, you should kind of know, right? Not immediately and fully and completely, but you should have some idea of what you're doing, of what God is calling you to. Um, but I want to, again, highlight there's a difference between calling and ambition. Right? Ambition could stop at any time. You could get bored of it. You could go, no, it's too hard. I'm stopping. But a calling is something that doesn't stop, even if you try to stop it. Right? Jonah was called to Nineveh. He went, I don't want to be called to that. I want to go the other way. And yet, God steered him to his calling. Right? So, what is our calling? Well, at the very least, our calling in the here and now is to please him, is to worship God, is to honour God, is to follow him, right? is to get to know him, to read his word, to, to seek Jesus. Um, some of us are called to go to work hard and, and put money into the church to help support it. Some of us are called to lead the church. Some of us are called to serve the church. Uh, some of us are called to raise kids. Some of us are called to evangelise here. Some of us are called to evangelise there. Some are called to move on and plant. Some are called to stay behind and build. But whatever we are doing, who says, make it our goal to please God. Like, that is what all of this is about. It's about getting to know Jesus. It's about pleasing our God, pleasing our Heavenly Father. And um, Paul and Timothy finish this thought with a super challenge in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due from the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Here's the real challenge, right? There is eternal consequences for our actions, um, even us as Christians. Um, whilst we cannot be saved except by anything except Jesus, it appears in Scripture that there's almost different levels of salvation. Depending on the life you've lived, you're either saved and rewarded, or you're saved and you feel regret, because you only just made it. But it's not down to you whether you're saved or not. Um, it's down to Jesus and whether you're following him. Uh, in Matthew 25, we can read of Jesus' account of this judgment day. And there's two similar parables just before that in Matthew 25, of which talk of being watchful and, and making sure you're ready, right? making sure you're ready for Jesus to return, because he will. Um, in, in the end of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says that he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Um, and then he goes on to say that he rewards those sheep who fed the hungry, who welcomed the homeless, who clothed the needy, who cared for the sick, who visited um, those people, believers or not, not sure, who were in prison. And then he punishes the goats who did not do as he asked, who didn't manage to do that. Um, Paul says uh, to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy, that Christ will judge the living and the dead. Um, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter, verse 13, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though there is only one as a skin. <coughs> Judgment Day is this big, scary thing we read about, or it's the Six Nations. Fifty. <laughs> um, it's Judgment Day, Six Nations. It's just rugby. It's, just, it's a rugby thing. It's a rugby thing. But it's not a rugby thing. Judgment Day is a thing we read about uh, in the Bible, which can feel quite scary, right? You can feel a bit, oh, I don't know if I should be reading about the end of the world. I don't, that's not literal. I don't know how to interpret it all, so I'm not going to read it. No, read Revelation. Try and understand what's happening. Read Daniel. Read um, Isaiah and another kind of bits which prophesy about it, but read what Jesus said as well. Like, read the Gospels. Jesus talks about what happens. Um, judgment Day seems to describe Jesus as the judge of all of the living and the dead. Uh, he separates the sheep from the goats. He separates the people who knew him, who followed him, who followed God, and the people who didn't. And then both are judged. But um, what I want to overwhelmingly highlight today is that in Judgment Day, right, God is just. God is perfect. God is right. 
God is loving and God is knowing. Mm. There are many judgments that we do not know about. We would find it possible to call. Right? How do we call um, what happens when you know, tragic things like children die? Or when those who are kind of mentally unable to um, make informed decisions about when the, whether they want to follow Jesus or not? Um, we would find it very difficult, I think, to, to judge reformed sinners. Right? If it turns out that a really bad person um, wholeheartedly repents and comes to Jesus on the deathbed, we would be like, but they did all that bad stuff. But God doesn't, God sees their heart. Um, we, and even like isolated people groups and tribes who, who would not have had the chance to know about Jesus. We don't know what the judgment is, right? We would find it really hard to call those judgments because we are human. But God is just. God looks at the heart, not the outer appearance when he judges. Um, Revelation specifically talks to of, of two books. There's the book of life, which is what the Lamb reads, Jesus reads, and says, is your, is your name in the book of life or not? Um, but the people whose names are in the Lamb's book of life and have followed Jesus, they go to the Father, and um, before, they, before they get there, the deeds written in the books of judgment are read as well, and that kind of gives people a reward. So, be, uh, be extra careful, right? What am I saying? Listen carefully. I'm not saying that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. Um, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. But once that judgment has come, okay, after that separation of sheep and goats, there's a judgment, there's a reward for sheep, right? There's a reward for goats, and that reward is just. So personally, Okay, this is not 100% biblical, but or rather, this is not taken from scripture, but this is my interpretation of what that says. I believe that there will be good people who were not Christians, who will suffer less than other people, but they will still suffer. And um, I believe that some Christians, or Christians who were, were Christians, but were really bad at being Christians, and did not really follow God at all, but were truly saved, I believe that they will suffer, but still be saved. They will suffer, as, as I said there, right? They'll, um, they'll be saved, but their works will burn up in front of them and they'll be like, oh, if only I had done more, now I know how important it is. Um, I believe that people who knew or sought the one true God, possibly even by another name, um, will come and know God and see Jesus, right? Because I believe that it's God who makes that decision and God is just and God is loving and God is perfect. He can see fully all ends and make that judgment where we can. So, reward for your works, but not salvation by works. Salvation, Jesus only, remember the worldly thing. And Paul says, we will receive what is due for us, the things done whilst in the body. Cool. So, I tried to come up with some exciting analogies of what it's like to have a new body. Um, I thought of different superheroes or fictional characters, um, because apparently that's what we do. So, um, <laughs> but I just couldn't find anything that worked, right? Couldn't find anything that worked. I was thinking Doctor Who, Doctor Who regenerates, mm -hmm. right? Except that it's still just the same person, right? His new body is not better than his old body, apart from his David Tennant, because he's better than all the other doctors, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I thought maybe Superman, right? Superman, if he's in the middle of a fight and there's some kryptonite about, he goes, oh no, I'm just a man now, and you know, he starts beating him. And, Sad. And suddenly the kryptonite wears off and he's super invincible again. That doesn't really work. I even wondered about Neo in the Matrix when he finally realises he's the one at the end. And he's like, well, this is really easy. I can fight you. And just, you know, he does everything one handed and flexes and bends the corridor. But they just don't really work. Because um, in none of those are you actually getting a new body. And in none of those are, is the new body, body like better than the old one. It's just a bit rubbish. Nothing really comes close. Um, the closest I think we can get is at the end of the last battle. C.S. Lewis's um, Narnian Septuagint, whatever the word for seven would be. Um, at the end of the last battle, spoilers if you haven't read it, it's great, read it. Um, at the end of the last book of Narnia, the last battle, um, the Narnian people have been pushed through the stable door and they are in a land more real and more alive than what they know. They are in new bodies, they seem like they're dressed in their royal clothes. they're not dirty anymore, um, they're not in chains anymore. 
um, the old are young again, they're not injured, um, everything is better. And Aslan himself invites them to come further up and to come further in. And the Narnian royalty from over the years are having a discussion about this new country they're in. And someone says, I have come home at last. This is my real country, I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it until now. The reason why we loved the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little bit like this. This is better, right? For our new bodies are for a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, to live how we were supposed to live. New bodies are not the be-all and end-all. That is not what is promised us alone, but the new bodies for a new creation, for the new heavens and the new earth. So we will, I feel like, we will say something similar to that, right? We'll get to heaven and be like, man, this super physical body is amazing. This super physical grass is amazing. Um, if you've read some of Imagine Heaven, um, then some of the kind of descriptions of, of what happens are really exciting to read about. Um, take them with a pinch of salt, because we don't really know, but uh, they're really you know, interesting to, to hear about. Um, I feel like we'll say the same. We'll be like, I've come home at last. This is my real country, I miss it, there's enough heaven, this is where I belong. The reason why I sometimes love that earthly tent is because it sometimes reminded me of this future heavenly mansion, this future heavenly um, home which God built for us. Um, so to finish, I'm not sure if there's any sand. Is there any sand? I forgot to ask. We'll find out. Oh no, that'll be okay. Maybe. Oh, we're going to listen to that song again. Okay. I'll pause it. Um, we're going to listen to the song again. Um, I want you to consider the words as it's being sung. Um, but I feel like it'd be a good time to kind of respond just before um, before John had to come back up to lead us in some more song worship. Whilst this song is playing, um, if there's something you've heard today that you want to respond to, just take some time to respond to it, right? Respond to it kind of yourself or, you know, go to the back, go to the front, come talk to me. Ask someone to pray with you for, for the Spirit. Ask someone to, to pray with you for that assurance. But listen to these words. Then. Thank you. 